Hi everyone, this is Victoria Nadolet and here with me are three gentlemen from Nigeria including Mr. Michael Oche, Yusuf Suleiman and Kester Oibo. Today's discussion is going to focus on the conflict of electricity laws and its implication to access to modern energy such as electricity in Nigeria. This webinar is part of the African Energy Transitions book launch and the three gentlemen have a chapter focused on the conflict of electricity laws in the book. So without wasting any time, I would like Mr. Mike to briefly introduce himself and then thereafterwards, Yusuf and Kesta will also introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Victoria. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to my co-panelists. My name is Michael Uche Ukwonu. I'm an energy and environmental law practitioner based in the city of Abuja, in Nigeria. I practice law at the law firm of the Law Partners in the city of Abuja. And I'm a member of the Association of International Petroleum Negotiators. I'm also an arbitration, an arbitration practitioner, a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, UK, and also a member of the Environmental Institute of Australia and New Zealand. Thanks for having me. My name is Yusuf Sulema. I'm a practitioner based in legal practitioner based in Nigeria. So I am a partner in the law firm of Suleiman, Belgoria and Co. And um, a research enthusiast. I work a lot with um, Mike and other scholars in writing academic papers. And it's so nice to be a part of um, Victoria's book and so nice to be on this panel. Thank you. All right. Akesta. Hi, I'm Kesta Ibu. I'm an associate with Compose Mentis in Nigeria. Currently, an LLM candidate at the University of Dundee Center for Energy, Mineral, and Petroleum Law and Policy. And um, I'm an energy enthusiast with lots of uh, contributions in energy policy in Africa and particularly in Nigeria. It's been a pleasure to work on this project with uh, Yusuf, Mike, and uh, we thank Victoria as well for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Now, would like you to highlight the key issues in your chapter because uh, this book chapter will also be featured in our final book. So the video will be featured in the final book. So I'd like us to go into detail with respect to electricity laws or the conflict of the laws and how it negatively impacts on the efforts to access modern energy in Nigeria. Uh, Mike, would you like to do the introduction? Thank you very much, Victoria. Well, our chapter, our contributory, contributory chapter to the book is titled Nigeria's Electricity Laws and Upgrade Renewable Energy. So in essence, what this chapter is talking about is to highlight you know, or expose on the con what we call the conflict of electricity laws, which is the conflict um, that, it's, that is existing amongst the uh, electricity regulatory framework for Nigeria and how this conflict uh, has occasioned the slow development of, uh, of electricity in Nigeria as well as enhancing access to electricity in Nigeria, particularly in the rural areas. And in this chapter, we, have, we went ahead to give some evaluative, some, some um, elaborative value to the conflict of electricity laws as a concept, where we, we, we look at the conflict of electricity laws from different dimensions, and that is the intra-conflict of law and the inter-conflict of law. The intra-conflict of law refers to intra-constitutional conflicts, that is, conflicts existing within the constitution, which is the ground norm uh, for uh, the ground norm of all laws, and uh, we were able to uh, detect some some um, inconsistencies in the constitution with regards to electricity regulation, which we feel uh, has impacted negatively on on uh, the ability of Nigeria to have uh, to enhance access to electricity for its citizens. We've also um, what we call an interconflict of laws, which is a conflict amongst all the laws uh, in the electricity regulatory framework of Nigeria. We are, that's uh, 
the constitution, the Electricity Power Sector Reform Act, and setting uh, regulations as made or created by the National Electricity Regulatory Commission, which is the electricity regulation, a regulator for Nigeria at the federal level. And so this is what this uh, uh, chapter is all about. And we will to highlight how this, this conflict of electricity laws has impacted negatively, negatively on the development of the electricity sector in Nigeria and you know, inhibited access to electricity in Nigeria. And we, and we made um, um, uh, some recommendations for policymakers and people in government as to that this conflict and how to avert it in order to achieve uh, adequate access to electricity in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now I, I think it's Yusuf come again with his contribution. Is it Yusuf Orchestra? The paper actually um, did a brief of, of overview of um, some of the legislation or laws that regulate electricity in Nigeria. And we were able to trace this to the Constitution, the Electric Power Sector Reform Act of 2005, which was enacted by the National Assembly, and then the Legal State Electric Power Sector Reform Law, which was enacted in 2018 by the Legal State um, House of Assembly. So the Constitution, as we highlighted in the paper, um, categorizes electricity under the um, concurrent legislative list, making electricity um, a shared authority between the federal and state governments is not so far-fetched. It is in, all, in order to allow the federal government to manage the um, national grid while the states manage whatever is not on the national grid. And then deep, more um, deeply, it is to ensure that electricity gets to every household. Because if only the federal government is allowed um, to legislate on this and manage and regulate electricity under the exclusive list, it will mean that it may be impossible to um, obtain uniformity in terms of regulation across the country. And if it is, um, that's if only states are meant to to handle it, but if only federal is allowed to handle electricity, it means there may be likely difficulty in reaching every household, considering the fact that Nigeria is vast in terms of landmass and and and, and, um, and state as well as local governments. So it may be uh, it may be very difficult to reach every state. So um, the constitution under um, particularly items 13 and 14 of the constitution of the concurrent legislative list in the Constitution and pass both the National Assembly and State House of Assembly to legislate on electricity. In emphasizing its mandate under the Constitution, particularly at 1013, the National Assembly went ahead to um, um, enact the Electric Power Sector Reform Act, which is meant to be the supreme document or the chief legislation to, um, for the attainment of the federal government's mandate. And some of the things we highlighted at the um, EPSTRA of 2005 actually did is to establish the National uh, Electricity Regulatory Commission as the main commission, main body um, in charge of um, implementing all the policies of the federal government, as well as all the sanctions and powers of the federal government. It also establishes the um, renewable energy, um, renewable energy, um, Rural Electrification Agency, sorry, as well as Rural Electrification Fund. So Rural Electrification Agency is meant to implement the objective of the federal government in attaining sufficient electricity through both on and off, off, off grid sources. It also empowers the um, commission, the National uh, Electricity Regulatory Commission, to make regulations, and this is very important, to make regulations in, um, in the exercise of its functions. And in exercising this, in, um, this power, the um, commission um, has um, enacted several um, regulations, but uh, some of them are so important and far um, reaching when it comes to achieving energy sufficiency, especially of grid electricity. And some of these include the embedded um, electricity generation um, regulation, a captive energy 
regulation as well as isolated and standalone breeds. And this, as Mike and uh, particularly Mike is going to um, elucidate on, is meant to be, um, uh, if we look at the spirit of these laws, especially the constitution, this is meant to be within the purview of the state governments. But then the um, and this is uh, some of the conflicts we are talking about. Uh, but then the NEC Commission is making regulations on some of those. By the time we look at all the powers, um, all the um, re regulations the National Assembly has, has made, um, we'll see that there is so much, so little for states to now legislate on as it is. Meanwhile, we observe that states actually are supposed to be the, the driving wheel of um, energy sufficiency in Nigeria. Chris and Mike and, and Kesta are going to talk more on this. Um, but then one state has gone ahead um, to, to legislate, to make a, to enact a particular legislation is legal states. And this is the legal states um, power sector reforms, reform law. This came very, um, so, uh, not too long ago in 2018. And this is meant, the law is meant to boost electricity, um, generation, transmission, and distribution within within legal states, and um, as, as as far as it is not on the national national grid, it's also established a board. Um, L, um, legal. Yusuf, I think we've lost you. Yes. Um, so, so I was I was trying to say that um, uh, in addition to all this um, legislation, there is, there are also some policies that, that are relevant when it comes to this sector, the electric sector in Nigeria. And, um, some especially for renewable energies, and some um, some of them are the um, Nigerian Renewable um, Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy. Um, which this is meant to guarantee energy efficiency in Nigeria, basically, and also the Economic um, Recovery and Growth Plan of the, uh, of, of the federal government, which um, also uh, tries to improve energy efficiency and tries to consolidate on the and rip of, of Nigeria. So basically, these are these are the legislation uh, relevant when it comes to energy regulation in Nigeria, and these are uh, basically what we discussed um, in the paper, uh, particularly our chapter. All right, thank you. So I understand, Mike, you're going to come in with more uh, contribution with respect to that chapter, and then Kesta will be making the concluding remarks. And then I'll ask a few questions with respect to the book, the, the general theme of the book. Yes, uh, what I just wanted to uh, highlight briefly is what we actually mean by giving with the right hand and taking back with the left. Uh, by that, the meaning and context of that uh, sentence is that while the federal government is allowed by the Constitution, to promote and regulate electricity. The same constitution allows the state governments to regulate and promote electricity as far as it does not affect the national grid or exactly as the constitution stated it, to areas that are not covered by the national grid. The states have confidence in that. But what we see is that the National Assembly went ahead to enact the Electric Power Sector Reform Act and made provisions in certain uh, sections of that act that seem to impugn or override the states in that constitutional competence of regulating and promoting off-grid renewable energy. Because any electricity that is not covered by the national grid, as far as concerns are concerned, the way we understand it, it means the states have Competence to regulate and promote electricity that's off grid electricity. So, but we've, we've realized that the, the electricity power sector reform act has made provisions on off grid electricity, which we feel is uh, unconstitutional. The electricity regulator, that is the National Electric Regulatory Commission went ahead to make certain regulations uh, with reference to the, the um, embedded power um, generation, captive 
power uh, generation, independent electricity dis distribution networks, and even mini grid regulations, which we feel are generally under the purview of the state. So, in essence, the Electric Power Sector Reform Act has taken away, or proposed to take away, the powers it has given by virtue of, and so that's actually the crux of our chapter and uh, as to the um, amendments of the Constitution, particularly uh, paragraph 14 of the concurrent legislative and even the Electric Power Sector Reform Act, which is uh, contained uh, in details in our paper. So that is the crux of, of our main argument. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now I'll call upon Kester to make the concluding remarks and also highlight his contribution with respect to that chapter. Thank you, Victoria. Um, Yusuf and Michael have set the tone already for me to go further to discuss the legal and governance perspectives of all that has been highlighted with regards to the Nigerian uh, electricity uh, industry. Um, as noted, we have highlighted some intra-conflict and inter-conflict between the laws, regulations, and governance systems that exist in the supply industry. And uh, I will be speaking directly to how this affects the growth of off-grid investments that would ordinarily ensure uh, sufficient energy security in the supply industry in Nigeria. Uh, it's been highlighted in a number of uh, publications and uh, news highlights as well, to the effect that uh, a good number of Nigerian citizens, industries, and uh, manufacturers rely on independently generated power with use of these generators and order to generate power for themselves at a very high cost. And we believe that if all of these resources can be put together and government gets its art together in the regulatory system and governance approach, a lot of this uh, cost can be put down and uh, power will be made available through off-grid solutions and mini grids as well. Uh, we also in that chapter try to look at what some jurisdictions have done and uh, what's the approach should really be? Do we have separate uh, systems for upgrade? Do we have it integrated in the entire supply industry regulatory uh, framework? Or do we all part ways uh, as we have in, uh, in South Africa? Uh, and then what has uh, the political statement in Nigeria got to do with all of this? What support can government do uh, and provide for investments to come into this particular sector that is yet uh, untapped. Uh, and then we, we, we thought it was necessary to also highlight the need for collaborative efforts in seeking government support, both at the federal level and at the state level. This is because uh, when you speak of upgrade, you really are speaking to rural areas, places not connected to the national grid. And we know that it's a, it's a huge burden to, uh, on government just now to be able to uh, extend, uh, carry out grid extension programs as much as they want to do. And a good number of the people who are outside the grid are still suffering out for lack of electricity and it's, it's hindering development in those sectors. So we, we believe that the best approach would be a corporate federalism system where there's, there's a connecting framework that enables both the federal government and state to carry out distinct responsibilities that would encourage these investments. Why is, it, why is the governance approach necessary for this to happen? It's because it is true a governance approach that is clear, that is precinct, that is direct as to what it wants to achieve, that you highlight issues of financing and, and recouping of the investments. And nobody wants to put in money into a system that you cannot recoup such an investment. And so it's necessary that these frameworks are clearly uh, detailed such that uh, we know where the borders of the, the federal regulatory system ends and where that of the state regulatory system also begins. As Yusuf highlighted in his remarks, Lagos State is once uh, taking the lead in this regard in that they have uh, commenced what they call the, uh, the Light of Lagos project, uh, which has about three components. In, so they, they, they're dealing with issues of street lightning, embedded power project, and uh, also lighting up of uh, government infrastructures and facilities. And to be able to do that, they need to rely on existing frameworks to carry out these projects off-grid, interestingly. And um, at the moment, the, the regulatory system in Nigeria understands that uh, 
off grid and mini grid systems can come in different approaches. We have the captive power, we have the embedded power, and we have the mini grids. And all of these are put together, need to work within a framework that allows investors to put in money and take benefit of the power supplied and recoup their investments. So uh, what this chapter has tried to do is just highlight these governance issues and approaches and make recommendations as to how to get it clearly from the onset. All right, uh, thank you very much for that. I'll just raise a few questions with respect to the general theme of the book, which is energy transitions in Africa. So uh, I understand like your chapter is mostly more on analyzing the conflict of electricity laws, but also electricity, it's a form of modern energy, which most African countries are advocating for in order to tackle the challenge of energy access and also in order to transition to a low carbon economy in a way that we are sure that people will have access to electricity. So as lawyers, in most cases, we do focus on the law, but the question is how, how applicable are, the, are those laws? Because even if there are no conflicts and everything has been amended in a way that the, law, the laws are perfect, can they be implemented to ensure that Nigeria tackles the challenge of um, energy access or lack of access to electricity. So that's the first question I'll address to maybe Mike. And then for yourself, I would like you to take us through the, the, the role of natural gas in ensuring access to electricity, because with electricity, it can be good from different forms of energy, including fossil fuels, natural gas. So if you can just slightly take us through that with respect to your chapter. And, and then for Kesta, in the conclusion, you said you've made certain recommendations to the policymakers. So I'd like you to highlight some of those recommendations that you highlight in your, in your chapter so that the Nigerian policymakers or even African policymakers can be able to learn from a few of those things and ensure that uh, their people have access to electricity. So I'll start with you, Michael. Well, a careful read of our chapter will reveal to one the argument that, that okay, what we're basically saying is that the fact that there are, there's a conflict of electricity law does not mean that there is an underdevelopment or no development of the electricity sector. What we are saying is that the conflict of electricity law, laws is responsible for the slow de development of the electricity sector. And the slow development is quite significant because as more as the population is increasing, there's an increase of the increase in demand for electricity. And so the laws are applicable in their present status, yes. The federal government is trying to regulate and promote the electricity sector within the existing electricity regulatory framework, fine. But the fact that the states are not involved in the scheme of things, they do not have their skin in the game when it comes to regulating and promoting electricity, is an access to electricity in Nigeria. So the more the population increases, the more the pressure is on the federal government to meet the electricity demand, which is struggling seriously to meet because the states are not, are not allowed to perform their position. So apart from that, yes, there's, there's also a need for a few amendments here and there to make uh, a clear uh, and express amendment to the fact that the states should be allowed to regulate and promote off-grid electricity because the manner in which is couched within the constitution uh, leaves a lot of room for different kinds of uh, interpretations or, or expressions of views, which may not be in tandem with the uh, intent of the drafters, which we believe as authors in, that, uh, in our chapter, that the intent of the, of the drafters of the constitution with respect to electricity regulation is that the states will be allowed to uh, regulate off-grid electricity. And regulating off-grid electricity does not mean generally uh, only, rather, that uh, uh, the states be uh, involved in some off-grid renewable energy, you know, some captive kind of uh, system. The states 
can be allowed to even have their own state breeds. That is off grid, which is off the national grid. The states can, uh, um, can embark on their own state grid uh, projects or captive projects in some community or in some uh, industrial cluster or set. So that's our, our argument, basically. In a nutshell, it is not that the present state of the law is unapplicable or is not having, um, yeah, that, that is unapplicable. What we are saying basically is that it's not having the desired effect because the states are not allowed to have a, a share of, of, of the regulation and the promotion of the electricity in Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much for that, Michael. So, in a sense, like the laws um, applicable, but however, the conflicts make it uh, hard or they are slowing down the efforts to ensure that all the Nigerians have access to electricity. That's a very good point. Exactly. Our viewers to exactly. take note of. Then I'll get back to you, Yusuf, because last time we had many people asking uh, about the issue of the role of natural gas, and I know. Uh, with the estimates, current estimates, they show that the the gas that is maybe being flared in Nigeria is capable of electrifying the entire Nigerian region, the entire Ecuador region. Hope you could just kindly highlight just a few things briefly. The the driver for um, energy sufficiency in Nigeria actually is going back to get right our laws. These laws are there. I mean, there are so many um, sources that people in Nigeria, both um, governments and both federal government and state government, and even private um, investors, investing in different forms, various forms of um, energy sources in Nigeria, like um, uh, natural gas, like um, hydro, where hydro is very expensive, so usually it's, 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 it's the government. But then you see even biogas, and um, people converting waste and then looking at the possibility of turning them into, ele into electricity. But then when you look at the laws that says that um, whenever you generate up to um, one megawatt, you throw it back into, into the national grid, a national grid that does not have, that is not, that does not have sufficient capacity to transmit most of, this, most of this energy. So we have um, an issue of transmission. So if, if you have up to let's say ten thousand megawatts, it's you will have will have a problem of moving this electricity to um, to end users. So even whether whether we, we tap into natural gas, which is in abundance, whether we tap into um, all these biogas and biofuels, which is in abundance, looking I think we've lost you again, Yusuf. Uh Krista. Would you let me just uh, add further to what Yusuf has been speaking on, uh, and and narrow it down to uh, gas utilization for gas uh, for power projects in, in Nigeria, particularly. Um, I know that Nigeria is one of the countries that is truly blessed with gas resources, and uh, as a 2016, we had over 186 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves. Uh, which we we are utilized and uh, benefit potentials that have been highlighted in the existing gas uh, master plan and policy in Nigeria is the gas to power project, and um, the aim of that policy is generally to grow our uh, gas utilization for power generation uh, very very much high above us uh, as uh, more than what we have today and. Um, that has seen a number of gas uh, gas power plants being installed um, uh, to an extent uh, integrating gas gas turbines into existing steam turbines as we have them now and um, uh, to a large extent the problem has always rested on um, infrastructure really uh, more than uh, the contributions of uh, regulations and laws to gas utilization. It has always been more existing infrastructures, moving gas from point A to point B, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, issues of security around the region as well. So uh, as Yusuf was stating, we need to do more with our laws to tighten up the physical systems in gas utilization 
Uh, so when you bring international developers for these gas projects, they are able to make good returns that uh, are particularly uh, uh, domestic price regulations don't inhibit making profits from gas utilizations, particularly when they are used for gas, uh, power projects. But as you know, uh, it is something that, is, that is, is, is common in the entire power sector, which is that when you generate power, you want to be able to get back returns for it. But what we have seen in the past is that it, the structure of the power industry is such that the generators generate power, there's a bulk purchaser who then sends to the distributors and distributors on the long run are having issues of liquidity. And so that also affects the beginning point, which is generation. And when the liquidity crisis transmits from the distribution and back to generation, it also affects the gas generation projects as well. And so that has been a major inhibition to uh, the gas to power projects that uh, we, we have seen uh, in, in Nigeria just now. And we are optimistic that uh, the current administration and uh, most of the industry players would continue to collaborate to see that uh, these limitations are resolved uh, as quick as possible, really. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Kester, for highlighting that issue on gas. So I'd like to have the concluding remarks from all of you, just like one minute, just highlighting your, the takeaways for our viewers or even the policymakers with respect to your chapter. I think I'll start with you, Kester. So just do your concluding remarks. Uh, all right. I'd, I'd like to take this uh, outside the context of uh, of Nigeria and speak wider to the African African uh, continent, um, particularly relying on the, the C4 project of the United Nations, uh, which has noted that uh, we are a long way away from um, what is required to be done in terms of financing and development of sustainable energy projects in Africa. And uh, this, is a, this is a major challenge for a continent that is described as a dark continent. This is a major challenge for a continent that is seeking to catch up with the energy transition. And necessary steps ought to be taken to ensure that um, the right frameworks, the right systems are put in place to, to get out of this quagmire as we have it now. Uh, so we, we, we generally propose that for the sub-Saharan African uh, continent to really catch up with the rest of the world in terms of energy security and transition, uh, we need to realize that uh, the goals we set must be followed up with innovative funding mechanisms, uh, which would drive this, uh, this development, as well as new sustainable technologies. Uh, Africa must begin to learn that we don't have to rest on the rest of the world to develop technologies that we utilize to enhance our energy systems here on the continent. So we must begin to work towards developing sustainable technologies, particularly in light of uh, the uh, fourth industrial revolution as we have it now on our doorstep. Uh, and finally, the role, of, the role of the law here would be to create an enabling environment through regulatory and institutional frameworks, as well as policies that favor investments and attract investments. Nobody wants to invest in a place with high political risk and uh, regulatory uncertainties. This will increase the high cost of, will increase the cost of finance and, uh, and investments as well. So Africa must get its act together and begin to rally around each other to develop the energy industry. All right, thank you very much for that, Kester. I've liked the points of uh, Africa looking forward to be self-sustaining, whereby we don't just have to wait for the rest of the world to solve our problems, but we can also try to be innovative to invest in the sectors in which actually do matter in the, on the continent. So, Mike, would you like to make your concluding remarks? Yes, uh, my concluding remarks are around the, the state's capacity, both financial and technical, to embark on electricity regulation and promotion. Now, I'm very uh, passionate about that aspect because I feel that uh, the states being allowed to uh, have their skin in the game when it comes to the promotion and regulation of electricity will go a very long way to uh, achieving a rapid access to uh, clean and sustainable electricity. But, but, but some people could um, raise uh, some concerns about the state's financial capacity to be able to you know, embark on electricity development within their respective domain. 
Yes, uh, while that's a plausible uh, argument, uh, I think as we have highlighted on the issue of cooperative federalism as one of the approaches towards the governance approach towards the uh, rapid electrification of, of Nigeria, particularly rural areas, I think nothing stops the states at regional levels, you know, from collaborating to electrify their, uh, their, their collective domains as far as it does not affect the national. That's one uh, aspect, one possible uh, solution. Another solution is to uh, embark, to collaborate rather with the federal government uh, to upscale of grid electricity development. They are already doing that at the, at, at the level of on grid uh, electricity development. That is the national grid. We have the Niger Delta Power Holding Company of Nigeria, uh, where the federal government and the 37, the 36 states of the federation, uh, the federal capital territory, and even the local governments have a joint ownership of that company. And that company, the Niger Delta Power Holding Company of Nigeria, uh, is what the objective of that company is to implement the national integrated power project. You know, and and what would the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the federal government and the state governments are already collaborating to enhance grid expansion and uh, grid tide electricity. Why can't they also channel uh, part of that energy towards off grid electricity development as far as it does not impugn or in, uh, um, impact on the competence of the states to regulate and promote off grid electricity? I think that's also a very good uh, option for the states to embark on since, it, since they may claim that they may, not, they may lack the national, uh, sorry, the financial capacity to embark on, uh, on electricity development and regulation. So these are the two options which uh, we've uh, recommended for the states to, to, uh, to, to explore because we feel strongly that the states uh, having their skin in the game, having a part, an active part or role to play in electric, electricity development, uh, particularly in rural areas, is very, very key to the overall um, assessment of of the access to electricity in Nigeria and indeed in Africa. So that's my uh, concluding, uh, concluding uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yes, so for you like to make your concluding remarks in two minutes, and then that will be the end of our webinar. I was just trying to um, emphasize the importance of getting our electric electricity sector up and working. Are you, are you with me? Yes, yes. Okay, up, uh, up and running. If we are to um, attain self-sufficiency and economic growth as a nation. So, and if we are going to do this, particularly in Nigeria, we have the, the electric sector, the electricity sector has to be unbundled. The entire structure has to be unbundled in a way that allows as many as possible stakeholders to be able to play their part, especially in utilization, in, in, in utilizing off-grid options um, and renewable and cheap, cheap renewable energy sources, like um, all, all the sources that we have mentioned. And if, if this is going to be so, so that um, industry playmakers can be able to, 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 to start from the beginning to generate and make their profit at the end of the day without much um, um, hindrance by, by all, all, all the regulations that we have. And if we do this, um, I'm sure that economic growth is going to be on track. And this starts with good laws, especially we have to achieve the main purpose of the constitution, um, especially particularly. All right, Yusuf, I think we got the most part of it and then we lost you, but I think you had made all the points. So this marks the end of our webinar. Thank you very much, Kester. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you very much yourself.